Anyway, uh, back then, uh, uh, Augustana had, in, uh, every morning during the week, had a, a class for mentally handicapped children. And that was in the, I guess is the building is the same place, where, the one that burned? Is this the same place and the same location, basically? Okay, that's where it was. And so I would come once a week and have a little devotion with, uh, with the kids who were in that class. So again, in a sense, I did some kind of uh, worship service uh, here at Augustana a long, long, long time ago. So anyway, uh, good to be back after, after all that time. So anyway, uh, we gather together to uh, reflect on the word of God to us today. So in the name of the Father and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I have chosen not to deal with, directly at least, to deal directly with, with the text that is the gospel for today. But uh, I'd like to lift out from it a couple of St. Mark's descriptive statements and, and use those statements as sort of a, a jumping off point for a gospel, for a good news word uh, for our gathering this morning. And those descriptive statements by Mark are these, from the Gospel. And they brought to Jesus a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment. And then after Jesus uh, healed this man, uh, Mark tells us, and the man's ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. And so as I looked at this and also considered a couple of the commentaries, it was pointed out that because of some of the words here that Mark used, that the man had a speech impediment, and then after he was healed, he spoke plainly, that he probably wasn't you know, without any speech whatsoever. Even though at the very last of the gospel reading today, uh, the crowd's response was, he, Jesus, even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. Apparently this man wasn't totally mute. He wasn't, you know, didn't have any speech at all. And uh, because later on he you know, spoke plainly after the healing. And, and as I, those descriptions kind of caught my attention of uh, some neighbors I had. I uh, grew up in a small town in Michigan. And uh, we had kind of a compact uh, uh, neighborhood or, or block that, that we lived in. And a couple of our neighbors uh, backyards kind of bordered our backyard uh, where I lived. And uh, this was when I was in, I don't know, elementary school or something like that. Um, and one of the neighbor's backyards who backed up to ours, uh, uh, their name was Cislo, Mr. and Mrs. Cislo. They had, they had three children. Uh, the oldest was Shirley. She was, I don't know, two or three years older than I was. And then Clyde, and he was about my age. And then the youngest was Mary. Uh, so the three children... But uh, their parents uh, were regarded, considered, spoken of as deaf mutes. They were deaf, and it's not that they couldn't speak at all, but uh, they could make sounds. And it was that kind of guttural sounds and that sort of thing. And you could even sort of, from t at least more with Mrs. Cislo uh, than her husband. I forgot her first name. His name, husband's name was Ed. But she was a little, could be a little bit more... Uh, form words a little bit more. You still had to really listen and try to gather from the context what she was saying to understand what she was saying. Um, and so anyway, they, they were deaf mutes, but they still made sounds and tried, tried to form words. Um, and one time, uh, one of my friends and I, I remember we were in our backyard, my backyard, and we were playing catch with a baseball. And I don't know, I don't remember exactly how this all happened, but somehow... Uh, the baseball, one of us threw the ball over the Cislo's garage, which backed up to our backyard, and went over there. And before we were able uh, to go and retrieve the ball, uh, Miss Cislo appeared, and she had the ball in her hand. And through some of the noises and the sounds and motions she was making, uh, she was indicating that this baseball either almost or actually did hit her on the head. And uh, so my friend and I, you know, we played that off, you know, and we pretended like we didn't understand what she was trying to say, although we did. But anyway, uh, she gave us the ball back and, and she went about her business. Uh, another thing, uh, that this is something that my mother uh, told me, and uh, 
this, this may have even been before I was born. I, I don't know. I don't remember how she told that, or maybe I was very young, because I certainly don't remember this, this incident. But uh, Mr. and Mrs. Sislow were over at, at our house uh, playing cards uh, with, with my parents. And they were having a card game. It was either, had to be either Pinochle or Euchre. That's all, you know, that's all my cards my parents knew how to play. And so after one hand, uh, as my mother tells it, Mr. Sislow went, and so my dad got up, got their coats and hats, handed them to them, and off they went with kind of puzzled looks on their face. And then after they left, my mother said, Norman, I think he was just saying he was asleep and didn't have a good hand. And so anyway, because they couldn't understand what he was saying, my folks, or at least my dad, you know, ushered them out the door uh, probably before they intended to go. But anyway, uh, great neighbors. And in fact, uh, Mr. Sislow was very helpful to, uh, to the kids of the neighborhood because he had some kind of a sharpening mas uh, machine in his garage and he kept uh, all the neighborhood kids' ice skates sharp. So during the winter, we'd go over there and you know, he'd run through his uh, sharpener and we'd have good sharp ice skates. Well, anyway, this is where um, I jump off from the text. Uh, from this man who had a speech impediment and uh, was healed so that he could eventually speak plainly. And again, my remembrances of uh, Mr. and Mrs. Cicillo next door. So I'm jump going to jump off there and I'd like to read to you. Uh, I, I subscribe online to a, uh, a, a devotion every morning, real brief, and it's from a Glenn McDonald. He's a retired Presbyterian minister, but uh, he has this thing called morning reflection uh, every day during the week. And um, I, I love what he does because he has some really good examples uh, sometimes that he applies to text. But let me just read one of these of, of a day or two ago. This is what he writes. Mary Ann Bird grew up feeling unlovely, unpresentable, unloved. From birth, she had been afflicted with a variety of disfiguring features. She recounts her feelings and the moment in which everything changed in her book, The Whisper Test. And now this, now this is from her book. I was born with a cleft palate, and when I started school, my classmates made it clear to me how I looked to others. A little girl with a misshapen lip, crooked nose, lopsided teeth, and garbled speech, kind of like our neighbors, the Cislos, and, and probably the man in the text today. When schoolmates ask, what happened to your lip? I tell them I'd fallen and cut it on a piece of glass. Somehow it seemed more acceptable to have suffered an accident than to have been born different. I was, I was convinced that no one outside my family could love me. There was, however, a teacher in the second grade whom we all adored, Mrs. Leonard by name. Actually, we, excuse me, annually, we had a hearing test. Mrs. Leonard gave the test to everyone in the class, and finally, it was my turn. I knew from past years that as we stood against the door and covered one ear, the teacher sitting at her desk would whisper something, and we would have to repeat it back, things like, the sky is blue, or do you have new shoes? I waited there for those words that God must have put into her mouth, those seven words that changed my life. Mrs. Leonard said in her whisper, I wish you were my little girl. And that's what she says. And then uh, this Glenn McDonald concludes, Mary Ann Bird ultimately became a teacher herself the kind of teacher who, like Mrs. Leonard, knew the transforming power of words. I wish you were my little girl. And Mary Ann Bird's life was transformed. I mean, we're not, he doesn't tell us in his devotion or anything about whether or not she ever had her cleft palate repaired uh, so that she could kind of uh, get rid of her, her speech impediment. Uh, we just don't know that. But despite her physical disfigurements through this teacher, she realized that she was loved. She was loved by someone outside her family. 
someone who was not, in a sense, obligated to love her. Ephatha, Jesus said to the man in the text. The man's ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. Certainly a transforming word for that man. And so that word, Ephatha, be opened, may not be a transforming word for any of us, as it was for that man. But how about other words of Jesus? When he said, I did not, I mean, you did not choose me, but I chose you. John records that in chapter 15 of his gospel. You did not choose me, but I chose you. Now that, of course, was originally spoken to the 12 disciples. But surely those words are directed to all, to, to Jesus' disciples of all times and in all places. Those words are directed to you and to me. You did not choose me. I chose you. And of those, who knows, millions, billions, whatever, disciples who came after the time of Jesus, many of those disciples, and we all probably know some of them, uh, have physical disfigurements and handicaps. Some of them. But every one of them, every one of us, has the spiritual disfigurement of sin. Every one of us has the spiritual disfigurement of being, by virtue of simply being human, our human nature, of being, as St. Paul writes, blind and dead toward God. St. Paul even goes so far as to say that by our human nature we are even enemies of God. Blind, dead, enemies. That's the spiritual disfigurement that you and I and every person has. And yet, Jesus has chosen us. Huh? And yet, Jesus has chosen you. He chose us. He chose you. Even though, through his divine omniscience, he was able to foreknow every sinful thought you would ever harbor. Through his divine omniscience, he was able to foreknow every sinful, hurtful word you would ever utter. He knew all that. Through his divine omniscience, he foreknew every single sinful act you would ever perform or engage in. He saw it all for every one of us. And yet, those powerful transforming words that he uttered to all of his disciples, I chose you, in spite of all that he knew. I chose you. That is certainly a humanly inconceivable choice, at least it is as I think about it, as I try to think about whom I would choose, the kind of people I would choose to be my friends, my family, whatever. Yet, he did that. And that choice of choosing you in spite of everything he knew that you would think, say, or do. That choice is ratified with water and with other power-infused, transforming words of Jesus. Namely, 
in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. His choice of you he ratifies in our baptism. And all those sinful thoughts and words and deeds of which we all have a warehouse full. They are dealt with other powerful transforming words of Jesus that we will hear again this day. This is my body. This is my blood given and shed for you. In spite of everything that I knew about you, given and shed for you because I have chosen you. Given and shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. And through these powerful transforming words of Jesus, that warehouse full of sins that we each have is completely emptied. That's the powerful transforming words of Jesus. And so this, again, humanly inconceivable choice of us by Jesus, that choice transforms our lives so that they are characterized by humble thanksgiving and praise. I mean, I mean really, Jesus, of every thought and word and deed, he knew, in spite of that, he chose you and me anyway. Humble thanksgiving and praise for that choice. Our lives have been transformed so that they are uh, also characterized by, by unhesitating repentance. Because just because we've been chosen, that doesn't mean we stop sinning. And so, as Luther encourages us daily, we repent. And again, the choice still holds. Because of that transforming power of those words of Jesus, our lives are characterized by a winsome witness to the one who has treated us so and who has chosen us. Our lives are therefore characterized by willing and joyful obedience to the way our Lord has called us to live and to follow him. You did not choose me, Jesus said. I chose you. I chose you to be my disciple. I chose you to be a member of my kingdom. I chose you to be a member of my family. I chose you as my son or my daughter. I chose you. If that's not good news, I don't know what is. Amen. Now may the peace and power of God, which far exceeds our human understanding, Keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus now and always. Amen.